Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Today I'm going to show you how to measure the main bearing clearance and rod bearing clearance using this Honda B series as an example. If you're working on a different brand or configuration engine, you don't have to get too caught up in that. The tools required and the steps you're going to take are the same from engine to engine. And having the right main bearing clearance and rod bearing clearance is absolutely critical to the engine's success. With some appreciation to fine art, here's a diagram of what we're going to be going over today. You have a main bore, which will be the housing bore of the block that the crankshaft is going to reside in. You have the crankshaft itself. You have the main bore with the bearings in place. And then here's the final product. The main bore, the crankshaft, the bearing, and the blue is going to be the oil clearance. So when you end up, as you go through this process, is understanding how much room is between the bearing and the crankshaft itself. And the reason why we're saying vertical oil clearance is this is going to be the smallest amount of clearance the crankshaft will have. As you get closer to the parting line of the block, the bearing clearance gets larger to act as a reservoir for oil on both sides of the crankshaft to be picked up and put back in circulation. So the clearance at the parting line is much larger and changes due to bearing eccentricity. So we're only going to worry about the vertical oil clearance. You want to know that the vertical oil clearance is big enough that you have enough oil flow going through the engine because the oil is not only a lubricant, it is a coolant that's keeping all those high pressure parts that are spinning around from touching one another. Aside from your engine components, you're going to need the following tools. You're going to want an inside mic, an outside mic, and a torque wrench that you have confidence in. Once you've gathered the right tools, you're going to want to get a service manual or the right specifications for what your engine block is supposed to be. For example, this main tunnel on this engine block has a low limit and a high limit. This hole can be no smaller than this and no bigger than that. And the reason why they do that is that affects the bearing crush. When you bolt the engine block together, the main cap to the engine block, or you bolt the connecting rod together, you're forcing that bearing up against that component with a certain amount of force. If there's not enough force present, the bearing isn't held in place well and it can't bleed heat out of the back of the bearing correctly. If the housing bore is too small, when you go to bolt that bearing together, it's gonna buckle and change shape and cause it to fail prematurely. So there's a low limit and a high limit to a tunnel on an engine part. So this main tunnel has a low limit and high limit. The connecting rod has a low limit and a high limit. The crankshaft has a low limit and a high limit. You're trying to get in between those measurements as a starting point. And if you need to make fine adjustment, you can use an oversized or undersized bearing in a thousandth increment. The first thing I need to determine is that the main housing bore is the correct size. So in order to do that, I'm going to install the main caps back on the block in the order and direction that they came off the block. You can't take this cap and put it over here. It doesn't work that way. The caps seem to stay on the block in the same place, in the same direction that they came off the block. If you have a block that's missing main caps, you can't grab a main cap off of one block and put it on another without having that block aligned, bored, and honed. When I'm installing the main caps back on the block, I'm following the service manual's instructions and I'm doing it in two steps. And I'm making sure that I have oil present on the threads. If you're dealing with an aftermarket faster than like ARP, then you're going to follow their steps. But if you're using an OEM faster than like I am today, you're just going to follow the OEM specification and be as smooth as possible with the wrenches. To determine that the main housing bore is correct, I'm going to take my outside mic and I'm going to set it to mid limit, put it in the vise, zero my inside mic, and then take the inside mic, put it in the block and see if they line up. So I've measured the main tunnels on the engine block and I have a max variance of three ten thousandths of an inch. So less than half a thou from front to back and everything in between. 
This is pretty good considering it's a weaker aluminum block. When you deal with cast iron racing blocks like a V8, you can have the same number across the board because those parts hold shape very well. If you're dealing with an engine that has less integrity or a split case engine, count on things being a little bit more of a variance, but you wanna have everything within half a thousandths in this part of the engine block. Keep in mind when you're doing this, when you're putting these main caps on, be smooth with the torque wrench, have enough leverage and strength to pull the torque wrench nice, smooth, and evenly. If you're bouncing around on your torque wrench like you would on a tire lug, you can create some interesting problems for yourself. So be consistent with the torque wrench. If the measurements you're getting don't look like they make sense, stop and figure out why before you jump to assumptions. Now that we've determined that the main tunnel's within specification, we can take a look at the crankshaft. This crankshaft has not been machined. It's out of a good core engine that when I took it out of that engine, the bearings all looked really nice. If you're dealing with an engine that's spun a bearing and the crankshaft is affordable, I recommend you just get another crankshaft that isn't damaged. If you're gonna send the crankshaft out to have it turned, when you get it back, you need to measure that crankshaft in different locations on the same journal because you can get egg or taper into the journal when they machine it. And this means you'll have kind of a variable oil clearance and then you have to account for that while you're measuring so you, if you have a thousands of taper in a crankshaft which is a ton but i've unfortunately seen it before i wouldn't use that crankshaft if the part's been machined make sure that it doesn't have any egg or taper in the journal if the crankshaft is inexpensive and it's damaged when you take the engine apart i recommend you just find a good used crankshaft to measure the crankshaft we're going to use an outside mic Keep in mind that these are fairly sharp edges on this tool, so when you go to put it on the crankshaft, you do not want to be hitting the crankshaft with the mic. It's a, it's a very careful, very deliberate set of movements with your arms to keep this thing from getting beat up because you can nick the crank with this tool, which is gonna set you back in time. So you're gonna be careful as you approach the crankshaft with the tool. So I've measured the crankshaft and I have less than half a thousands variants on the main journal. So I'm happy now and I can go ahead and put the bearings in the block and then I can measure the oil clearance. Now it's time to put the bearings in the block. I'm using a coated King bearing. I do feel that the coating that King is using is a really big advancement, probably the biggest advancement I've seen in bearing technology since I started building engines. And the same type of coating technology is used by some OEM level racing teams that have really overcome some monumental problems with just using a coated bearing. So really neat stuff, uh, worth your investment. When you're putting the bearings in the block, there's a tab that's gonna locate that bearing in the block. Now's the time to see how the bearings align upper to lower and that you've installed the bearing correctly in the block so oil can flow through the bearing body onto the face of the bearing. Since I've already measured the main tunnels and I've already measured the crankshaft, I'm only gonna install one set of bearings on one cap and see if I'm within the range that I'd like to be in as far as oil clearance. If I need to change to an HX bearing, I can know now without installing all the caps on the engine, just saving time. So I'm gonna set my outside mic to the diameter of the crank main and then I'm gonna zero it out 
plunge it into the block and see what the vertical oil clearance is on this particular journal. So I've measured this bearing clearance and I have just under two thousandths of an inch. So I'm gonna swap in an HX shell. So I have H and HX bearings here and that's an HX is an extra clearance. H is a standard clearance. And what I'll do is I'll put half a set of HX in the engine and open that oil clearance up a little bit. So I'm gonna take this cap back off, switch to an HX, confirm I'm getting the clearance that I want that I can move forward with the rest of the caps. I had a little bit less clearance than I wanted, so I moved to an HX bearing on the cap side. If you're wondering why I put the HX bearing on the cap side and not the block side, the block is the aluminum, so it's already gonna expand and grow more than the cap itself. So I'll kind of balance that out as the engine goes up the temp. So now I'm just under two and a half thousandths on the number five main. I'm gonna follow the same pattern on the bearings on the rest of the mains, and then I'll measure them individually. So I've measured the main bearing clearance and I have around two and a half thousandths of an inch and I'm happy there. In order to get there, I had to split bearing sets between H and HX. If I would use an H set of bearings on the block, I would be at two thousandths of an inch, plus or minus a small amount. And if I use all HX bearings, I'd be around three thousandths of an inch, plus or minus a small amount. You're adjusting in half thou increments when it comes to H and HX bearings if you're using a split set. I do recommend that you purchase H and HX bearings if you're building your engine because if you're doing this over the course of a weekend and you want to make that change to the bearing clearance but you don't have both sets available, now you're going to delay your project another weekend. So I always keep H and HX on hand when I'm putting an engine together. It just gives me some adjustability and keep in mind you're working in half thou increments. So this is where I'm gonna run the engine at, it's 0 0.0025, 0 0.0026 along the crank mains. Those are larger than factory clearances, but with that being said, that larger main clearance is gonna offer more oil flow to the rod bearings because that's how the rod bearings get oil. If you have very tight main bearing clearances, you're not gonna have a lot of oil flow to the rod bearings, making it more susceptible to spinning a rod bearing. The next step I'm gonna take is to measure the thrust clearance or end play of the crankshaft. That's the distance the crankshaft can move front to back in the engine block. This is only 180 degree thrust on this engine, so I don't have to put the main caps back on in order to check the thrust clearance, but I like to take this opportunity to see how the crank turns in the engine. So I'm gonna pull the main caps off, I'm gonna lubricate the bearings with a light thin oil like automatic transmission fluid, I'm gonna to torque everything back up and that'll give me an opportunity to spin the crank and just see how it feels in the block. It's a good opportunity. I've gotta clean all these parts anyway, so getting some oil on these components doesn't hurt me at all. And it gives me again an opportunity to see how the crank feels when it's turning in the block. The thrust bearing is installed with the oil troughs facing the crankshaft. These are just reservoirs for oil to sit in as the crank's spinning round and round. The thrust is not pressurized fed, it's fed off of the oil that's bleeding out of the main. So there's just some reservoirs here to capture some oil as the crank's spinning round and round. The reason why I'm using a thin oil like automatic transmission fluid is I wanna feel how the crank feels. If I put a thick assembly paste or assembly oil on there, it's gonna be much harder to turn the crankshaft and I won't be able to get a good feel for it. What you're trying to do here is just see if the crank 
has an even feel to it as it rotates. If the crankshaft doesn't rotate well or rotates fine in one axis and then you turn it 90 degrees and it gets sticky, time to see if that crankshaft's bent. So I've torqued the main caps back to spec, but I have not turned the crankshaft yet. You don't wanna turn the crankshaft in the block until you have everything tightened back up. Believe it or not, there are engines that when you lay the crankshaft in the block without any main caps, there's so much distortion present in those main journals that you can damage the bearings. So wait till you have everything torqued up and then you can give the crank a spin and see how it feels. So I have a magnetic base dial indicator that I've attached to the main cap and now I can just move the crankshaft back and forth in the block and see the thrust clearance. In this case it's about four, four and a half thousandths of an inch, which is totally fine. Now we're going to move to measuring the rod bearing clearance. So we need to set our outside mic to the housing bore diameter. Then we can zero our inside mic and start checking the rods individually to make sure that the housing bore diameter is within the tolerance. Before you take the connecting rod apart, you need to be aware of which cap goes for which rod. You cannot mix the caps up amongst the set because you'll have a problem on your hands. This is a Brian Crower rod and he does label them with an identifying number that keeps you from mixing them up. But I would recommend before you take any rods apart, you get an engraving tool or a Sharpie marker and you just label cap number one with rod number one, two with two, so on and so forth, so you don't mix the rod caps up on the rods. So I've measured all my housing bores and they all look good. Now it's time to take the connecting rod apart. The connecting rod cap is doweled. So when you pull on it with your hands, it's not gonna just pop apart. So what I'll do is I'll take a socket, put it on the bolt and just give it a tap. Switch to the other side, give it a tap. And now the cap is free off the dowels. You don't wanna go beating the hammer directly on the rod bolts, not a smart move. But if you just give them a little tap of the hammer on each side, work it off evenly. Any doweled cap, you wanna be as even as possible as you remove it, so you don't cause too much deformation in the dowel. You can put the rod back in the rod vise, grab a couple of rod bearings to start off with, and see what we have for clearance. I've got my outside mic set to the crankshaft journal diameter, and now I can zero the inside mic in the outside mic, and then when I put it into the connecting rod, the difference will be the vertical oil clearance.
So I've measured my rod bearings and using a split set of H and HX, I'm right around 2,000 of an inch. So if you're new to this and this is your first performance build, 2,000 of an inch is a very universal place to be. It's a safe number to target when it comes to the main bearing clearance and the rod bearing clearance on most commercially available engines. My buddy Ben at EFI University told me a long time ago, when your oil clearances are too tight, everybody knows about it. And when your oil clearances are a little loose, nobody really cares. Reason being is when the oil clearances are too tight, those parts will touch down and start to destroy each other. Oil is the only thing separating metal on metal components inside of an engine. So that oil clearance is filled up with oil, high pressurized oil that's flowing through the engine out of the oil pump and it keeps all those parts happy, cool, and lubricated. If you don't have access to mics and you need to use plastic gauge, it's much better than not checking at all. This is a critical thing. It doesn't happen often, but once in a while, you'll get into a situation with a boxing error with a bearing manufacturer, or you've created a problem by swapping some caps around, and you just wanna know. You wanna know that you have oil clearance because oil is gonna be flowing through those parts, keeping them happy. So I hope this has been an informative video. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out, and if not, I'll catch you next time.